Good afternoon, Western Civ 1. So in the last lecture, I talked to you about the Black Death, which in Western Europe entered the continent in 1347, and it largely spent itself by 1351, four years. But I don't want you to get the impression that the bubonic plague was never again a problem. In fact, it was endemic but there would be outbreaks. Endemic means it's there all the time. Uh, but there would be outbreaks of bubonic plague, sometimes very bad ones, uh, for years and years to come in Europe. And the bubonic plague is not gone. Every year, somewhere in the, the, either the desert southwest, often New Mexico, sometimes in the deserts in the east of Washington State or Oregon, uh, you do, in fact, still get people coming down with bubonic plague. Yersinia pestis infects them. And uh, they seldom die today because we have, you know, treatments that can keep them from dying more often than not. And we've never had anything remotely like an outbreak of bubonic plague in American history that would cause widespread worry. It basically comes from living too close to rats in certain desert-like environments. Uh, anymore. But, you know, in the 14th century, that one wave that swept over Europe was absolutely horrific. Between a third and even half in some places of the population perished in four years from bubonic plague. Now, one of the reasons why we study the bubonic plague, the Black Death, as they came to call it, was is because of the sheer mortality of it. It is you know, as I said, 60 times plus more lethal than COVID-19. 60 times more lethal. Um, and, you know, we have had nothing even remotely on that scale in the modern period. The Spanish flu epidemic, you know, killed less than 1% of Americans in 1919, 1920. Uh, 100 years ago, exactly, by the way. Um you know that so this is this is unprecedented in world history the sheer death toll but another reason we study this it's consequences for european history because you'll remember what i told you was the 1200s what we know as the high middle ages was a time of relative prosperity uh cities were growing uh, farmers were growing more food than ever before. People were better fed on average than ever before. Uh, it was a boom time for the arts. Uh, we'll talk in the next lecture about Romanesque and Gothic architecture. Uh, manuscript illumination. The arts truly flourished in the 11 and 1200s. Uh, it was a dazzling time in many ways. And that was in part built upon this foundation of simply having more food and therefore more people living better lives because of that than had been the norm in European history before. And then you have the, the so-called Little Ice Age, the year without a, a summer and so on. In the 13 teens, the weather continued to, to, to be off and on bad. Uh, it wasn't continually four years bad like it was in the Little Ice Age, but often wet and cold winters uh, that weren't good for crop growing. So the bounteous crops of the centuries before dwindled into much less productive crops, although you still had a very large population. So when the plague hit, it had an underfed, uh, crowded in the city population that it could strike. Exactly the kind of people would be most vulnerable and took the most lives. But one curious side effect of killing a third of the people in your civilization, the survivors often carry a lot of guilt. Survivor's guilt, it's called. Like, why was my dear mother taken and I wasn't? Why was my wife taken and I wasn't? Uh, you know, no doubt it was deeply scarring to see so many people you loved and cared about die before your very eyes. Or, to protect yourself, as I said many did, you flee while they're dying so they don't infect you. Think about carrying around that the rest of your life. So I'm sure the psychological damage to people was immense, even though they survived the plague. But there also was 
an economic boom after the Black Death. It wasn't so much caused by a change in climate, it was caused by the fact that there were a lot fewer people than there had been, and yet the natural resources and the built environment was ample, right? All those fields, now one third fewer people to divide them up. You know, when somebody inherits their parents' land, it was not uncommon for every son to get a piece of it. But you might be the only surviving son now, so you get to inherit the entire estate and not divide it with your brothers. Incidentally, in Western Europe, uh, this is an important idea, primogeniture, P-R-I-M-O-G-E-N-I-T-U-R-E, -E, primogeniture. The G-E-N there is like, uh, it's from gena, gena, uh, gero, the, to bear, uh, the firstborn, primogeniture, primogentus, is firstborn in Latin. Primogeniture meant that the firstborn son usually inherited a nobleman's estate. And the lesser sons had to fend for themselves. They might get a little cash from daddy when he died, but they would not get the lands. Daughters, incidentally, routinely in noble families didn't inherit hardly at all. They again might get a little cash, but no land whatsoever, and land was where the real wealth was. Daughters were assumed to be marrying off. And a daughter had a dowry that went with her. Now, this is hard for us to even get our minds around. And I've got to explain to you the theory of a dowry and then the practice of a dowry. They're two different things. A dowry was, in theory, money that parents gave a daughter when she was getting married. In theory, that money was for her upkeep so she could live the life she'd been accustomed to growing up as a girl. So wealthy families would send with their daughters when they got married a t bundle of money called a dowry. And that was in theory for the girl's upkeep when she's now a bride and a wife. However, the laws of Western Europe being what they were, married women could not make legal decisions their husbands made the legal decisions. An unmarried grown woman could actually make her own decisions, but not a married one. So a, a woman was actually often better off when she was a widow <laughs> than when she was married, because she could at least make decisions that governed her own life. But their uh, assumptions about male headship meant that men made all the decisions for married women. And so all this, although this money was theoretically the woman's when she was sent into marriage, in practice, its management was 100% in the hands of the man she married. And in reality, most men thought of the dowry as like a bride price in reverse, uh, that, that it was money that people paid you to take a daughter off their hands. That's, that's the way most men thought of dowries. It wasn't what they were in legal theory, but in practice, since the men got the money and... Uh, the uh, uh, the women just had to put up with whatever their husbands wanted to do with the money. Um, so, you know, uh, that's I wanted to, to understand that idea of dowry and the idea of primogeniture. In noble families, usually only one son inherited all the land of his father, and the younger sons had to fend for themselves. Again, sons and daughters might get a cash uh, gift when their father died or their mother died. But the land, which is what really mattered, went to the eldest male, uh, primogeniture. Now, among the more common people, among middle-class people and, and lower-class people, lower-class people seldom had much to leave, but among the middling classes, city folk, uh, it was often more evenly divided. In fact, it could, it could literally be all the boys and girls in the family inheriting equally. That wasn't uncommon. Not among the nobility, but among the middling people, city folk and the like. Um, so anyway, imagine you're one of those people, a middling small farmer, and you're the only surviving child because your two brothers and sisters died. You inherit the whole estate, and you get to get all the benefit of farming it by yourself, not dividing up the, the land into three bits or four bits or something. 
So that was one of the reasons why in the aftermath of the Black Death, people prospered more, was they got bigger farms out of it because so many of their siblings died. And maybe their parents died and left it to them when they were still relatively young to farm it and do something with it aggressively. So as painful it is to think about it, economically for farming families, the death of a third of your family or half of your family could actually benefit you financially. Another benefit that you may not have ever thought about, the Black Death essentially began the end of feudalism. Remember, feudalism was serfs tied to the land. But when a third of the serfs died, it meant there weren't enough workers on a manor farm to farm the whole thing the way the Lord would want it farmed, right? A third of your workforce is dead. How do I get more workers? I have to pay them money to work for me. They don't have any feudal obligation to work for me. I've got to get outsiders and pay them money to come. This meant for the very first time in European history, really, farm laborers could make money doing their job. And of course, this was a great incentive for people to up and run off from the manor farm. Run off to get jobs working on other manors for money. Instead of working just because you're required to by tradition on your home <laughs> manor, run off to somebody else's manor and become a paid employee. That's pretty good. Money in your pocket instead of money, instead of labor that you just have to give to somebody else because it's tradition. Also, a third of the townsfolk died or more. And this opened up opportunities. Maybe in the village there had been three saddle makers in cutthroat competition. Now one of them's gone. The two surviving saddle makers can make more money. Or maybe, you know, a third of them are gone. And now that opens up a space for a new saddle maker to move in. So by having a third of the, of the businesses essentially shut down by death, it opened up business opportunities in cities. So economies of scale in the farm meant again, food production went up. Food people lived again better in the aftermath of the Black Death. But the change from feudalism to something else may be the single biggest change. The people were more and more disinclined to stick with it. In England in 1388, you know, 25 years or plus after the Black Death, the peasants there were, were getting so used to being paid that they wanted out of feudalism altogether, and they revolted. It's called the Peasants' Revolt of 1388, and marched on London to demand the king abolish feudalism. Now, in that case, it didn't work. <laughs> they got beaten in battle by knights, and the leaders were killed, but it shows the th shape of things to come and by the early 1400s in England and France, feudalism is essentially dead. Uh, if you want people to work on your farm, you got to pay them. Or you got to let them rent the farm and pay you a portion of the proceed. And that's what often happened. Another side effect, though, is a lot of times landlords, manor, lords of the manor, would say, you know, it's just not worth it to farm all this land. i got to pay these peasants now. What could I put on that land other than crops? Wool from sheep. And a handful of peasants could tend a thousand sheep on what used to be farmland. So over the course of the late 1300s, early 1400s, in England, in Belgium, in Holland, northern France, more and more landlords are switching to wool production from sheep rather than the traditional farming. So a lot of things change in the aftermath of the Black Death. But by the mid-1400s, Europe is booming again. The cities are growing again. So, you know, the Black Death was absolutely horrible to live through. I am sure of that. But if you did, and you didn't lose your mind from the horrors you'd witnessed, 10 years later, you might be in a better place economically than you've been even before the Black Death new opportunities, a new world being born, the feudal world being left behind. So that takes us up to the early 1400s 
And by the mid 1400s, we're beginning to move out of the Middle Ages. We'll talk more in a couple of lectures next week, but the 1400s is the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern period. You may not think of 1500 as modern, but historians do usually consider it the early modern period. All right, and we'll talk about why that is next week. Next lecture, I want to talk about architecture. I want you to at least learn the basics of Romanesque architecture and Gothic architecture. Uh, they're very important, and I might go back and start again next year with you guys on this. We'll be covering the Renaissance when we start in the fall. Uh, but And these things are so important for that. We probably will come back and touch base then. But I want you to at least know the terms, know the basics of it. And that'll be the next lecture. God bless.